27, has been to uh, bring us to an understanding of the church, to um, uh, understand why uh, we say in the creed, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, you know, what is the church that we would believe in her, uh, that we would trust in her. Um, and in so doing, I um, anticipate, I, I would hope, that um, we're bringing us, we're coming to an understanding of the church that is beyond our understanding. Um, so that's where we're moving, we're, you know, we're, to, we're answering the, the, those questions that are, uh, that were given at the top of your first lecture guide. Uh, who was the Orthodox Church? Where did she come from? Those are, that's actually one set of questions. The next two questions you could say are another set, a different kind of questions. What does she believe? What distinguishes her from other Christian churches? All right. I have handed out for you, to you, um, two handouts. Um, the one is from two fathers on the great mystery of the church. Uh, you'll notice that I have, oh, uh, thank you. Actually, actually, Alex, I've got this one. Uh, let's put this one, since it has a clip over there, and I'll take this one. Just put it on one of the chairs that's kind of in the middle so if anybody says something we can pick them up. These, this handout, the two Holy Fathers and the Great Mystery of the Church, will answer directly, perhaps, the first two questions. Who is the Orthodox Church? Where did she come from? And then they'll also give us a basis on which to address the second two questions. What does she believe and what distinguishes her from other Christian churches? You understand that the fourth question is something of a, uh, what would you call it? Oxymoron, is that, is that the right word? Because there's only one church. There can't be many churches. There's only one body of Christ. Only one resurrection. Um, so let's, uh, you'll notice that I have uh, wide margins for you there on the right uh, for these two Holy Fathers uh, for you to write your notes on. This first text is from St. Clement. He's the first Pope of Rome. He was in the first century. Um, this is an ancient, this is, it's called Second Clement, but it's actually an ancient Christian sermon uh, that is attributed to St. Clement, and maybe rightfully so. Uh, but anyway, this is a very, uh, very profound and a very uh, provocative and uh, um, um, very intriguing uh, text. Um, it's one of my favorite texts, actually. Uh, although I do not even begin to understand it. And I think that here we hear, um, we, we, we get into the, the mind of the early Jewish Christians. So then, brethren, if we do the will of God our Father, we will be of the first church, the spiritual one, which was founded before sun and moon. You'll notice what I've got in the brackets. Um, the Greek word here is katizo, uh, which, and I understand this is, this is my take on it. I mean, the, the, apparat the, the scholarly apparatus that I'm looking at did not make this point. So you take it for what it's worth. But as I, I'm thinking that when he says katizo, that when he uses this word that was established before sun and moon, I'm thinking that he is intentionally referring to Proverbs chapter 8. Verse 22, uh, verses 9 through 1. And so I think it would be helpful for us to look at that real quick, to get a sense of the biblical uh, background that he is presupposing when he says this. Um, 
some creation, uh, some, uh, sometimes this word katizo uh, would be translated as created, um, but it has a kind of, you know, it's, uh, there's another word that's used for created. Um, uh, in the adult ed, we've talked about that word. It's the word for poeo, which a poema, a, a creation or a poem. So God created the heavens and the earth. The word that is used is a poeo. Uh, which, which is like he, he, he wrote a poem, he built a poem. The world is a poem. This is a different word. Um, and it's, uh, in, eight, in, in uh, 8.22, um, it's talking about wisdom, or Sophia, uh, which in Greek is feminine. And I think in Hebrew also it's feminine. Uh, which um, in the 4th century, 3rd, 4th century or so, this wisdom was taken to be Christ. Uh, which... Um, um, even so, you know, even though it's in feminine, a feminine word, it was taken as wisdom was taken to be Christ, but it, it created something of a stir. This is what uh, what you know, we were talking about the heresy of Arius, uh, at the first session or so. Arius was the one who taught that the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, was the first creature of all the things that God made. This is one of his proof texts. The Lord created me or made me. Um, um, the beginning of his ways um, um, before, for, for his works um, but it's, it, the word is, is as I say it, it's katizo and um, it can also mean uh, to possess so it doesn't necessarily mean that he created the Lord from out of uh, that he created him from nothing it, it's it's it has these words, he founded me, he built me, he established me. But we're talking about the church, the spiritual church. So here St. Clement is not, uh, if in fact this is the text that he has in the, back, in the background here. He's not talking about God the Son, he's talking about the church. Or he's referring to the church. So the Lord made me the beginning of his ways. This is how it reads in the Greek. Uh, for his works. Um, he established me, now it's a different word actually, he established me before time was in the beginning. Before time was. He established me in the beginning, before time was, before he made the earth, even before he made the depths, before the fountains of waters came forth, before the mountains were settled, and before all hills, he begets me. The Lord made, and so forth and so on. So having heard that, you, you understand why, it sounds like St. Clement is, has Proverbs 8 in mind. Because he says, the first church, the spiritual one, which was founded, built, established, uh, bef using this word from Proverbs, before sun and moon, before time began. Um, if we do not do the will of the Lord, we will be of those of whom the Lord says, my house has become a robber's den. Uh, which may be going back to Jer Jeremiah chapter 7. Um, and then these other uh, passages also. I also have, and all of these passages that I'm referring to, um, they're all having to do with idolaters, you know, fornicators. Uh, a fornicator, a harlotry, is, is idolatry. It's a word for, it's, it's what idolatry is for the prophets. So when he says, my house has become a robber's den, uh, the, the, the meaning would be, my house has become a, a house, uh, has become um, uh, filled with idols, um, and my people have become idolaters. Uh, so this is obviously taken from when, when, when the Lord Jesus uh, uh, chases the money changers out of the temple. Uh, you've made my house into a house of idols, a brothel. You've made my house into a brothel, is another way you could say it. Uh, let us choose, therefore, to be of the church of life, that we may be saved. Um, now, I do not suppose you are ignorant of the fact that the living church is the body of Christ. For the scripture says, God created men male and female. The male is Christ, the female is the church. Now, we might uh, bring this text back tomorrow morning at the adult ed where we're talking about the mystery of gender because um, uh, there's there's much here I, I can't I, 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 I you know I, I, I don't know I don't know what 
exactly to make of it. Uh, I think that, again, this is early Jewish Christian thought, uh, which extends in the history of the church um, into, uh, especially into the early Syriac Christian tradition. Um, but I've been reading a couple of uh, books on early Syriac Christianity, and I don't find that uh, the particular scholar that I was reading does not address uh, the understanding of the church as as St. Clement is describing it here. So um, I've, I've, I've been, you know, pondering this text for years, actually. Um, so let me share with you what I think he might be having in mind. Um, and I'm drawing from indications, you know, from here and there that I've picked out from all of my reading. Now, um, and it's quite, quite fascinating if, in fact, this is what's going on. He says, um, let us choose therefore to be, now I do, I do not suppose you are ignorant of the fact that the living church is the body of Christ. For the scripture says, God created man, male and female. The male is Christ, the female is the church. You know, it doesn't really follow, does it? For, that the living church is the body of Christ. For the scripture says, God created man, male and female. Wait, wait a minute. There seems to be a gap in the lot. The, the middle premise is is missing. Um, so you have to. So we have to. We have to kind of conjecture. I have to conjecture what what's going on here. So you want you want to say something? No, I, I don't know enough about early Jewish practices, but could he be thinking that this idea of the Shekinah or the Shekinah? Possibly, the Shekinah. That's, that's consistent. The glory. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Um, but here's, here's uh, that's another a good point to, to factor into this. Um, you know, God created man, male and female. The male is Christ, the female is the church. Now, you remember in Genesis 1.27, what it says, God created man in the image and likeness of God. He created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, um, um, in the, I don't, I think, I, you know, I should, I didn't even think to look what the word for image, is, betula, uh, is in the Hebrew. Um, sounds like it's a feminine. I'd have to go back and check it. Uh, and ikona in the Greek, I think, is actually neuter. But anyway, uh, we know that the, you know, he's so, Saint Clement, he has the, all of the body, the corpus of St. Paul's text behind, in, you know, in front of me. He, that, that's part of the body of, his, of, uh, of, the, of the books. He, where does he talk about this? Uh, that that um, the books and the apostles declare. So St. Paul would be one among those books and certainly of the, of the apostles. And you know, in Colossians 1.15, we have that Christ is the image of God. And St. Clement here is saying that Christ is the male. Um, and, but it says also in Genesis, it goes on to say, 120, what is it, 26, 27, whatever it is, um, in the image and likeness left of God. So um, it so happens that spirit in Hebrew and in Greek is feminine. And um, I, there are many other indications that I don't know that I want to take the time to, to, to bring them all forward. I'll just cut to the chase here. Uh, I'm thinking that what is behind this is the understanding that um, man, man in the image and likeness of God is such because the male is an image of Christ Ephesians chapter 5 and the female would be the image of the spirit or let's say Christ let's say the logos um, the word of God you know the son of God which um, sets up some very profound and fascinating theological implications for understanding the church that um, that the woman 
is in the image of God in that she is in the likeness of the spirit. The man is in the image of God in that he is in the likeness of Christ, the Son of God. Um, you know, you have the Holy Spirit brooding over the face of the waters, and the, and the verb there is that, that of a mother hen brooding over her chicks or her eggs, uh, you know, in, in warming them up in order for them to hatch. So that, um, that man, as male and female, is created in the image of the church, which, as St. Clement says, did not existed before sun and moon, in other words, before time. Um, so, um, it, it, so, you know, I'm, I just want to, uh, uh, that man, as male and female, is in the mystery of God, and that God is uh, the image of both male and female. Um, okay, well, there's much that we can do about that, but I just want to suggest that to you, that this is what's behind this, that male, female, man, woman, is in, is, is in the image of God as son and spirit. Okay? You got that? I mean, there's, there's lots you can do with that, but we're not going to do anything with it right now, because there's maybe we'll save it for tomorrow. Um, okay, the male is Christ, the female is the church. Moreover, the books in the Apostles declare that the church not only exists now, but has been in existence from the beginning, for she was spiritual. Now, if the church is, as a, is like the female, if she's like, you understand, she's then the, uh, she's the uh, embodiment, uh, she's, she's what makes the lump to be alive. And uh, if, she is, if, she is the, if she is the spirit, if she's the Holy Spirit, if she's an element of the spirit, uh, for she was spiritual, okay, uh, but she was spiritual as was also our Jesus, but was revealed in the last days at Pentecost when the, when the Holy Spirit descends upon the body of the disciples, both men and women, and, 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 and incorporates them, raises them up spiritually and raises them up into the mystery of the church, which is the mystery of the Son and the Spirit um, in the Father, you know, um, in order that she might save us. This also goes back to Colossians 1.26, where, where St. Paul writes, um, the mystery of God that was hidden from the ages and the generations. What is that mystery? He goes on to say, hidden, the mystery hidden from ages and generations, but has been revealed in the last days uh, to his saints. And what is that mystery? It is the mystery of Christ in you. Well, how is Christ in you? You understand? He's in you through his Holy Spirit. So Christ the male, the spirit the female, if you will. Um, I mean, we can't be too hard and fast with these identifications because we're talking mystery where everything is fluid. But um, it brings out the, how the, the church um, is, is a spiritual uh, mystery that ex existed, as he says, has been in existence from the beginning. So it didn't just start now. It didn't just start on the day of Pentecost. It has been in existence from the beginning because the church is the mystery of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Um, for she was spiritual, as was also our Jesus, who but was revealed in the last days, in order that she might save us. This could go back to... Um, I don't have the text here, but it could go back to the wisdom of Solomon. Chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 14 and 15. So wisdom of Solomon, where it says that God did not make death. He made the, he made the generations in order for them to be, and the word is the word for salvation. But it could also mean in order for them to be healthy, to be healed, to be, to be whole, and to be alive. And then at the end of chapter 22, uh, chapter 2, uh, in the wisdom of Solomon, again, it comes back to this theme of the immortality of, of man, that, um, God did not that God made man in the image of his own eternity, um, and he did not make him to die. So the, the, so, the, but was, so the church was revealed in the last days, so she would be revealed, f understand, 
if you know, following this this possibility <laughs> that uh, what is in the back of Saint Clement's mind is Christ and the Spirit as the mystery of the Church, then you understand there'd be two moments of revelation in these last days. The first moment of revelation would be what? Can you guess? The incarnation. And how is Christ? Cons uh, how does he come? How does he become flesh? Uh, what does it say in the creed? Yes, who was uh, incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. So he's incarnate, he becomes flesh in the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. And when he becomes flesh, he becomes manifest. Right? So, he's, so here is the mystery of the church in its first concrete rev, uh, manifestation. So then the second rev, uh, manifestation, the second point of revelation would be what? Yes, Pentecost, when the Spirit descends in the form of fiery tongues. And of course, all of this is already hidden in the life of Christ because he's, you know, the Virgin Mary, um, when, she is, uh, when she conceives God in the flesh, it says that, the, that um, the Spirit will overshadow you. And it's the same verb that is used in the Old Testament for the times, there's at least three times in the Old Testament where the glory of God, the Shekinah, descends upon the temple, first the, the tabernacle of Moses, in the wilderness, and then the new-built uh, temple of Solomon, and then in Ezekiel, where we're talking about a church that doesn't exist here. It's apparently the heavenly church. And on the, all three occasions, the Holy Spirit descends and overshadows the temple and fills it with the glory of God, which is Christ. The glory of God is not some energy. It is Christ, um, such that nobody could enter it. Um, so in that, um, the Virgin Mary is revealed to be uh, the temple of God because she is, she is conceived of the Holy Spirit and the God is conceived in her in the flesh, not of the male seed, but of the seed of God, which is the Holy Spirit. Christ is, um, what does it say? Um, and he grew and increased in wisdom and in stature and favor with God and man. Then when the Spirit of God was upon him, he goes into the temple, the Spirit of God is upon him, and he, and he preaches from uh, the prophecy in of, of Isaiah. And he says, you know, the, 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 that uh, he will come and he will, that the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the, the lame will be made to walk. And the Lord Jesus says, um, this has been, uh, this has been, uh, come to, this has come to pass in your, in, in your day. This is now fulfilled. Going backwards, back in the life of Christ. He's baptized by St. John. He comes up, and what happens? He's, he know, the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the form of a dove. And then in the Holy Spirit, he goes into the wilderness, and he is tempted by the devil. And you could say he triumphs over the devil in the Spirit, by the power of the Spirit in the wilderness. And then, of course, he's raised, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that the Lord Jesus is doing all of these miracles, uh, which were all prophesied in the Old Testament, so that by these miracles, what the Lord Jesus is showing is that he is the Christ that the prophets were talking about, um, and that with his coming, the world is being recreated. It's being made anew. Death is being chased away. Um, life is coming into the world because Christ, who is himself the, le the resurrection and the life, um, is, is in the world. So my point being simply that um, with the revelation, with the first revelation of the church, which would be the body of Christ, we already have as well the manifestations, the revelations of the Spirit at, that is at work in the body of Christ, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, so when the, when the Holy Spirit descends upon the disciples in, at Pentecost, it's not that the church has started. Not that, you know, we like to say this is when the church was born. No, it's not true. I mean, this, you know, it's, uh, in a very refined way, you might say that's when the church was born, but no. Actually, the church has been from existent, in existence from the beginning. And what happened at Pentecost was the revelation of the church descending upon the disciples and filling them with the resurrection of Christ, the Spirit of Christ, and so thereby incorporating them, raising them up, as it were, into the mystery of the church, which was from the beginning. That is to say, raising them up into the mystery of Christ and the Spirit which were from the beginning, even from before the beginning. You follow that? 
What? Um, can, I mean, what does this do to your understanding of the church? I mean, you, you begin to see that the church is maybe a bit deeper, a bit more than what we thought, <laughs> at least in the understanding of the church, understanding of the Orthodox Church. Well, let's go on. Now the church being spiritual. In other words, the church being the uh, mystery of the Holy Spirit was revealed in the flesh of Christ in the ways that I was just describing. And do not, so uh, uh, um, thereby showing us that any of us, if any of us guard her in the flesh and do not corrupt her, because you understand, when you are received into the church, you're baptized. What happens when, you, when you're baptized? You come into the tomb of Christ, which is empty. That is to say, there's no corpses there. You go to any other tomb, it's filled with corpses. Or it's filled with dust because the corpses have disintegrated. So that's, you know, th th this tomb is empty. And uh, having been incorporated, having entered into the tomb of Christ, you have entered into his death. You have been, you, have been, you know, it's like you enter into the tomb and now you're, cl you're clothed with the tomb of Christ, with the death of Christ. And having been clothed with the death of Christ, you are clothed in his resurrection because the death of Christ is actually the death of death. So if you have received, and, and then you receive Holy Eucharist in the church, which is the body of Christ, and as often as we do this, we proclaim his death, we proclaim his resurrection. So you understand, um, having been incorporated into the church, you have been incorporated into the mystery of God the Word and the Holy Spirit from the Father. And so your body, having been washed with water, I mean, we don't just say words over you, you know, your, your, your body is washed with water, real water, which is an image of the Holy Spirit. Not an, not an image in the sense that it's, here's the Holy Spirit and here's the water like this, that is just kind of mirroring the Holy Spirit. It's more like, um, here's the Spirit, let's say, and then here's the water. You know, I mean, the water, we invoke the Holy Spirit upon the water. And so now we believe that, you know, that's beautiful. I, I, when, we do, when we do a baptism, I, you remember, I asked the kids. Um, they know, you know, having listened to the prayers, you know, that this, I asked them, you know, we take this candle, we say some prayers. Come now thou, come down now thou, um, O King, and sanctify these waters by the, by the grace of thy Holy Spirit. Then we put the, then I put the candle into the water and I make the sign of the cross. Uh, and I asked the kids at this point, okay, where did the candle, where did the fire go? And every time they have always answered, into the water. Where did the Holy, the fire is an image of the Holy Spirit. So where did the Holy Spirit go? It's like we lit the candle and the Holy Spirit grabbed the candle or we grabbed the Holy Spirit by the fire, if you will. And then we drew the Holy Spirit down <laughs> into the water and the water became filled with the Holy Spirit. So when you are washed, I mean, you're washed physically, understand? So your flesh has become cleansed, not just, both, both outside and inside, because it's the spirit, and he's spiritual. But he, 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 he spiritualizes, he sanctifies the waters. So now having been washed in the waters, your body is washed, but also your soul, your spirit is also washed. And then you understand, from there, where do we take you? After having chrismated you, and anointed you with the oil, which again is the embodiment of the Holy Spirit, you're brought to the chalice and you receive the body and blood of Christ as your bread and wine, as your food and drink. So now your whole body has become incorporated and has become united with the very body of Christ. Christ is no longer an idea that you talk about. Christ has become the living reality of your very body and soul. He has incorporated himself into you. So, you know, as we say in some of those prayers after the Holy Communion, um, enter into my veins, my heart, uh, my reins, you know, uh, uh, every, every uh, St. Simeon the New Theologian, and my, my, every cell of my body now has been, has been permeated, uh, penetrated with the Spirit of Christ. So, you know, in this sacramental context of the church, now, so this is when we read, we read this. Uh, no one, therefore, who corrupts 
Let's see, where were we? Um, thereby, it, thereby showing us that any, if any of us guard her in the flesh, that is to say, guard the church in the flesh, and do not corrupt the church. In other words, do not corrupt the Christ or the gift of Christ in the Holy Spirit that has been given to us in the church. He will receive her. He will receive the church, the body of Christ, back again in the Holy Spirit. I think this might be a reference to the resurrection on the last day. Um, for this flesh is a copy of the Spirit. And the, the word is antitype, which means um, it has to do with the... Um, do I want to erase this yet? Um, I think we're ready to erase this. The word is, um, it's like a stamp. So here's the stamp, and here's what's stamped. <laughs> so the body has been stamped by the Holy Spirit, and now it is you know, what is the negative? Is that what you call it? Uh, the mold but that's, that's been shaped by the stamp. Um, so now the body, in other words, the body has been, has been shaped by the stamp of the Holy Spirit. That's what this word means. For this flesh is a copy um, or a, a, an, an embossment. Could we say that? Uh, is an embossed um, um, co a copy um, uh, of the Spirit. No one, therefore, who corrupts the copy will share in the original. Can you see it from the image? If I corrupt this, you know, if I, if I mess this up, you see that? The stamp won't fit in it anymore. What's the flesh? I'm confused. Uh, the flesh. Our body. So talk, when he's talking about the flesh here, he's talking about my personal body. Yes. Okay. Your whole being. Your, here I think flesh means your whole, your whole body, both outside and inside. Okay. Yeah. So, um, in other words, uh, he may also have some Gnostics in mind here, because there, were the, 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 there was a group of Gnostics who taught that uh, the Spirit, um, you know, they're drawing from ancient Orphic religion, um, that the Spirit is this spark of divinity that's gotten trapped in the body. And therefore, what you do with the body doesn't really matter. The body is, 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 uh, is uh, disposable. Um, here, so here he's saying no. The body, the body is a copy of the spirit. It was stamped by the spirit, and going going further, going more deeply into the background of Saint Clement's uh, sermon here, the body was made to be a temple of God, and as a temple, it's made for God to dwell in it. So, if you know, if you make your body into a brothel, you know, a house of idols, the spirit can't dwell there. You're corrupting the temple of your body. And so the spirit will, chase, will, will be chased away. That too is drawing from Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Um, so, this, so this is the imagery that's, that I think is, is behind uh, this, this sermon of, of St. Clement. This, therefore, is what he means, brothers. Guard the flesh. So, you know, guard the, the flesh, the outside of you. But that includes also the inside of you. So guard your flesh, guard your mind, Guard your soul, guard, guard everything about you, so that, um, in order that you may receive the Spirit, in order that the Spirit, you know, may descend upon you and find a home where he fits, if you will, or where she fits. We're going to talk in Hebrew or Greek. Where she, f actually in the Greek, pneuma, it, pneuma is neuter. Yeah, Pneuma is it's Sophia that is feminine in the Greek. Um, so, okay. This, therefore, is what he means. Guard the flesh in order that you might receive the Spirit. And understand, the Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life. Um, remember what it says in, in John 1, 4, is it? And him was, so he was the light, and in him was life. No, is that how it goes? And the life was the light of men. So um, the, the Spirit is the life of Christ that we receive. So now if we say that the flesh is the church and the Spirit is Christ, now here's where I get a bit confused because it seems that he's changing the metaphor a bit. Um, and so I don't know why I haven't figured that one out. Now if we say that the flesh is the church and the Spirit is Christ, 
I'm wondering now if he's changing the imagery uh, like to Ephesians chapter 5 or even Ephesians chapter, um, what is it, where does it say? Christ is the head of the church. So, Because Christ, you know, Christ is spiritual. So uh, the, 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 the church here, I wonder if it, it, it's referring to, to us, the faithful. And Christ, I'm wondering if now, if we were to understand Christ in his Holy Spirit together, who are, um, who are descending upon the body uh, of the believers, of the faithful. So um, if we say that the flesh is the church, or let's say if we, if we say that the faithful are the church and the spirit is Christ, in other words, the Holy Spirit um, is the, sp the, the spirit of Christ, um, um, then, we, then the one who abuses the flesh abuses the church. In other words, abuses Christ and his Holy Spirit, abuses God. Um, consequently, such a person will not receive the Spirit, which is Christ. I think we need to remember that in the first century and in the second century, and even into the third century, uh, the church is still working out the doctrine of the, of the Holy Spirit. What is the relationship of the Holy Spirit to Christ? And oftentimes you'll find that um, the Holy Spirit is conflated with Christ and treated as though they're the same. Uh, you know, it sort of makes sense because, I mean, Christ is spirit. The spirit is, you know. It wasn't until the fourth century, the second ecumenical council that we talked about in 381 in Constantinople, remember, where the doctrine of the Holy Spirit was articulated finally um, as fully divine, but also as a separate or as a distinct uh, person in the Holy Trinity. Before then, the Spirit could be regarded as a power, as an energy even, uh, in some places. Um, so going on here. Okay, so great is the life and immortality which this flesh is able to receive if the Holy Spirit is closely joined with it. I mean, if you look at this closely, you'll see that there is not a fine distinction or a, a, let's say a fine definition of Christ and the Holy Spirit in their relationship to one another. They're somewhat confused, um, you know, in a, in a sacred way. Um, uh, so great is the life and immortality which this flesh is able to receive if the Holy Spirit is closely conjoined with it, that no one is able to proclaim or to tell what things the Lord has prepared for his chosen ones. So great is the life and immortality um, which this flesh is able to receive. I and mean, this is a you know, you, you read this in its uh, broader uh, theological background and you begin to appreciate the profundity, the, the, the beauty, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the profound uh, mystery that is, being, that, that is coming to revelation in the church, that is being revealed in the church. So great is the life and immortality which the flesh is able to receive if the Holy Spirit is closely joined with it. Okay, I'm going to ask you, I hope you can answer this question. Um, where is the flesh joined, or where does the flesh receive the Holy Spirit? On this side or in the tomb? In the tomb. In the empty tomb. In the death of Christ. That's where we receive the Holy Spirit. Um, and in receiving the Holy Spirit in the empty tomb of Christ... The death of Christ, you see, we receive life and immortality. Because the death of Christ is the death of death. So whoever is joined to the death of Christ is joined to the, is united to the death of one's death. And now in Christ, our death becomes the death of our death. And so a Christian funeral should not be full of grief. We're, we grieve because we realize that that's when we discover how much we loved the loved one that has just departed. But as St. Paul says, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Because the death of the Christian is the final union of one's death with Christ. So if you're united with Christ in his death, your funeral becomes, if you will, that becomes the proclamation of resurrection. And nobody's going to see that, are they? 
except those who have come into the tomb and who have experienced already on this side the mystery of Christ's death in them, working in them. If you're outside of the tomb, you understand what I'm saying? That, that this is not some scientific thing you can test with scientific experiment. This is a spiritual mystery that can be known only through inner experience. As one does what the church tells you to do, and you work following the church's guidance to put to death what's earthly in you. In other words, to putting to death in you everything that separates you from God. Because that's what death is. It's separation from God. In that dying in Christ, you begin to discover, precisely in the moment of dying, you, be, you begin to discover the life of Christ's resurrection. That is beginning to, 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 be, it's beginning to be revealed, to be, it's beginning to reveal itself to you in an invisible way, a hidden way, within you. In the joy that you begin to feel, in the peace that you begin to feel. Beautiful, you know, I have people, I've had uh, people who, who, who left the church and then they came back after years and years and one fellow in particular said to me that he came to me, he came to confession uh, to be re, to be, in order to be uh, restored back into the church and he said to me, you know, um, after my confession I was able to sleep through the night for the first time in years. There's a peace, you know, that he now had. Um, and that's, that, that, of course, is, 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 is a very common experience. Okay, so there's Cl St. Clement uh, in this, in this uh, writing. It, it's, a, it's chapter 14 of this writing that's called Second Clement, but it's actually probably a sermon, not an epistle. So he's in the first century. Um, I want now to move to St. Porphyrios, who was canonized. Uh, what do you remember, Tim? It was like 2004? He died in 1991, so we're talking about a modern-day saint. But before we move to him, do you have any questions or observations or comments that you'd like to share from, from uh, Clement of Rome, the first Pope of Rome? Then let's move on to uh, what St. Perfirius says in his book, Wounded by Love. The church is without beginning, without end, and eternal. Just as the triune God himself, her founder, is without beginning, without end, and eternal. Isn't that something? We've gone 2,000 years and the doctrine has not changed. <laughs> Still the same. In fact, St. Porphyrius is someone illumining St. Clement and he's actually confirming uh, what we are conjecturing about the background of St. Clement, that the church for St. Clement is the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because he says... The church um, is without end and eternal, just as the triune God himself, her founder, is without beginning, without end and eternal. She is uncreated, just as God is uncreated. If she's uncreated, she cannot be but the Lord Jesus. You know, she cannot be but the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit, because nothing else is uncreated except the Holy Trinity. Um, she existed before the ages, before the angels, before the creation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, as St. Paul says, she is, uh, the English translation uh, in, in, the, in the Wounded by Love book is, uh, she is a divine institution. But um, I looked up that where I have the Greek text of that book. When I was on Mount Athos, they had that in the, what, what the main city, and they had a book at a bookstore, so I got the Greek copy of it too. And the word is cathedruma, cathedruma, uh, which I think is probably the modern version of this word that we find in 1 Timothy 3.15 uh, where the word is um, edreoma because it, this is what the, the modern Greek does it, it tends to uh, um, you know uh, simplify these ancient words um, and, and um, so, it, it, so I'm thinking that this word is the same that St. Timothy uses in his epistle Chapter 3, verse 15, where he says, um, Oh, what? Um, um, but if, uh, let, well, see, that you might know how it is necessary for one to conduct oneself in the house of God, which is the church, the ecclesia, the church of the living God, the pillar 
and the and the foundation, the drioma of the truth. Um, this so institution. I, I, when we say institution, at least when I hear institution in the English, I feel I, I hear this uh, kind of a human organization that is governed by, you know, uh, an administration and it's and it's uh, it's uh, filled with bureaucracy and red tape and all that kind of stuff. And this is, but this is not what he's saying. He says Saint Paul, she is a divine, and I gave some of the meanings for this word uh, that is translated as institution. She's a divine establishment. In other words, she's she's a divine foundation. Uh, she's a divine temple, a uh, divine abode, a divine settlement, and in her dwells the whole fullness of divinity. She is an expression of the richly varied wisdom of God. She is the mystery of mysteries. She was concealed and was revealed in the last of times. The church remains unshaken because she is rooted in the love and wise providence of God. Now, St. Porphyrius, you know, he's talking in the spirit. So uh, I don't think we can expect him to be talking in a kind of a theologically precise way. Um, here it sounds like he's talking about the energies of God, the ener as though the church is an uncreated energy of God. But now he goes on into the next paragraph. The three persons of the Holy Trinity constitute the eternal church. Now the church is the communion of the holy persons of the Trinity. Uh, the angels and men existed in the thought and love of the triune God from the beginning. We men were not born now. We existed before the ages in God's omniscience. Um, there's a certain beauty here. Um, if if uh, the church is from the beginning, she doesn't just start and suddenly start to exist. She's from the beginning. She is this. She is an uncreated mystery, has having existed as long as God has existed, if we can talk in terms of time. And we were created then. Man was created, as Adam and Eve was created in the mystery of the church. So that somehow in our being created in the image and likeness of God, the Spirit, the Son and the Holy Spirit, we, we too didn't just suddenly pop into God's mind, as it were. Just you know, um, we have been known by God from the beginning, as you know. Again, speaking in temporal terms, as long as God is. Um, so that tells you that that you, 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 each one of you, it tells us uh, what it tells us what that we are each one of eternal value. That God knows you. He knows you deeper than you know yourself. As Father John Meindorf, my mentor, liked to say, he's closer to us than we are to ourselves. He knows your name. He knows your real name. And this is what makes, for example, the, uh, the scene of Mary Magdalene at the tomb so beautiful. Um, you know, she says to the Lord, um, he's thinking that he's the gardener. So where have you laid his body? Tell me and I will take him away. And remember how she comes to know him? She says her name. He says her name, Mary. And suddenly she knows him. So, you know, what's going to happen when we, when, we, when we see the Lord, when we come into his presence, and we hear him speaking to us, addressing us by our name? You know, in that moment, we will, not, we will know who we are, and we will know who he is, and we will know the mystery of ourselves because we will, we will see ourselves in his love. It's a beautiful image. Um, the, the love of God created us in his image and likeness. He embraced us within the church in spite of the fact that he knew of our apostasy. You know, he embraced us within the church. Going back to St. Clement, he embraced us within the mystery of himself. The mystery of his of the communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, he gave us everything to make us gods too. And Saint Porphyrius here is simply doing what Jesus did, quoting from the Psalmist: "I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, and yet you die like any prince." The, 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 I think the sense is, you were created to be gods, but you die like any prince, because and, and that's not what you were supposed to do. 
There's something has happened, something has been broken, so that you no longer live as gods. You live as like you live like any old like any prince, you die. He gave us everything to make us gods too, through the free gift of grace. For all that we made poor use of our freedom and lost our original beauty, our original righteousness, and cut ourselves off from the church. Now I put in bread in brackets here. Uh, what actually St. Porphyrius is going to go on and explain himself. Outside the church, far from the Holy Trinity, we lost paradise, everything. But outside the church, there is no salvation, there is no life. And so the compassionate heart of God the Father did not leave us exiled from his love. He opened again for us the gates of paradise in the last of times and appeared in the flesh. With the divine incarnation of the only begotten Son of God, God's pre-eternal plan for the salvation of mankind was revealed again to men. So that would indicate that there was actually three revelations, if not four. The first revelation would be when he actually created Adam and Eve and breathed into him the breath of life. And then part of that, and perhaps even the climax of that, when he would be when he built Eve, the mother of all living, the mother of life. Which would be a, you know which would be a prophecy that the woman is to be the mother of God, which means then that the that the purpose of all creation is for God to become flesh, and for man to become one with God. You know that's the that, that's the prophetic meaning of, of Eve. That's the prophet. That's the that's the prophetic mystery of the woman. You know, without the woman, this doesn't happen. Um, through the woman, we become one with God. God becomes one with us. Um, and then the second revelation, you might say, would be, I don't know, maybe when he revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai and revealed to Moses the pattern of heavenly worship, which was to be the model of Israelite worship and which is the model of Orthodox worship. And then the third revelation would be the incarnation and the fourth revelation would be Pentecost. You know, I'm just playing with, with, with this. But you get the sense that there have been stages of in which God has revealed himself to us, and, and we can read about these revelations of God in which he has revealed to us the meaning of our existence, uh, that he has revealed to us the nature and per, uh, destiny of our, of, our, of, of, our, of, our, of our existence. He has revealed it in the pages of Holy Scripture. Um, so God in his infinite love, with the divine incarnation of the, holy, of the only begotten Son of God, God's pre-eternal plan for the salvation of mankind was revealed again to men. This too, as St. Porphyrius is, is, is referring in the background to another uh, doctrine of the church, which is, he says, God's pre-eternal plan for the salvation of mankind was revealed again to men. Now, what was that pre-eternal plan? Outside of the Orthodox uh, tradition, I don't know, one might say uh, to forgive man so that he could live in heaven with God, something like that. Um, but, um, you know, there was forgiveness in the Old Testament. Blessed is he whose sin is, is forgiven, whose transgression is covered. The Old Testament had a profound experience of forgiveness. So there's more to it than forgiveness. And in fact, it's given in Psalm 82, Psalm 81, verse 6. I said, you are gods, children of the Most High. Um, the pre-eternal plan was for us to become um, one with God in the likeness of God. In other words, it was for us to become one with the image of God, the Son of God, in the likeness of God, in the Holy Spirit of God. So that the incarnation of Christ, of God the Son, was not like plan B because men fell. The incarnation of God in the flesh was the plan from the beginning. It was plan A. There was no other plan. So that's that's, that's what's in the background here, what St. Porphyrius is saying. God's pre-eternal plan for the salvation of mankind was revealed again to men. And for that reason, it might be all the more significant that it is not until after the fall that we see Adam naming his woman Eve, which in Hebrew means life, because she's the mother of all living. After the fall, she is, her purpose still has not changed, if you will. She's to become, she's the mother of all living, which means, I mean, there's only one who's living, and that's God. So, you know, to be the mother of all living means that she's going to become the mother of God. 
This was the plan from the beginning. God in his infinite love united us again with his church. He united us again with his church uh, as we were in the beginning. So it is now in the person of Christ on entering into the uncreated church. Okay, the, the, church, is, the church is uncreated. She's the mystery of God. Um, we enter the realm of the uncreated. We, the faithful, are called to become uncreated by grace. Do you hear the, 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 here's another oxymoron or whatever, it's a contradiction. You don't become uncreated. You can't become uncreated. To be uncreated is to be, I mean, you know, to become means that you came from someplace that wasn't. So this is the beauty of it. Just as the Lord became man, in other words, he changed without changing, and you hear that in the um, third antiphon. Well, how does it go, Dan? Um, um, o Son of God, who, um, who without change became man. Who without change became man. Now, have you ever, have you, has that caught you yet? Have you listened to it? Without change, you changed. That's what it's saying. So, in the same way, we, um, by changing become unchanging. There's a beautiful parallel here. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's referring to the mystery of becoming one with God. So we enter the realm of the uncreated. We, the faithful, are called to become uncreated by grace. To become participants in the divine energies of God, which, you know, which flood the world and which are centered in the church and to enter into the mystery of divinity. So you understand by now that to enter into the church is to enter into the mystery of divinity, to surpass our worldly frame of mind, to die to the old man, and to become immersed in God. When we live in the church, we live in Christ. This is a very fine-drawn matter. We cannot understand it. Only the Holy Spirit can teach us it. All right. Let us go to these four questions. See what you do with them now. I'm going to ask you to answer these questions as best you can, based on how well you, how much you have caught in these two readings from St. Clement and St. Porphyrius from the 1st century and from the 20th century. Who was the Orthodox Church? Who wants to take that one on? How would you answer to somebody who's asking you, and even notice that we don't say, what is the Orthodox Church? We say, who is the Orthodox Church? Hans, how would you answer that? Well, the immediate thing that comes to mind is that I want to say it's the body of Christ. Where did she come from, them, as the body of Christ? How would you answer that? Well, I can line up what we just went over. Yeah, sure. Your new understanding now, not your old understanding. <laughs> yeah, still trying to keep... Right, which well, you're still probably tried, still digesting. Yeah, yeah, uh, so where did she come from? Um, it's always been there from the beginning. It's part of God's plan, and it's more than... I want to say participation, but it makes it sound like we're outside and we're in, but we're always in God's mind from the very beginning, so it's, it's, it's hard to... Okay. But whereas we have from, from the very beginning... Okay, very good, very good. Now let's stick with those two questions. Alex, how would you answer the first one? Who is the Orthodox Church? Well, uh, I the phrase you used was the communion of the three persons of God. Okay. So I think that's uh, a nice way of putting it. Okay. How would you say, how would you answer, where did she come from? Where did God come from? Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. Okay. <laughs> um, well, Megan... What does she believe? How are we going to answer that question now? Does the question even, I mean, does the, how does the, I mean, does the question even make sense to you now? I mean, do you find yourself feeling a little bit, um, you know, awkward or whatever, uh, dis dis disjointed by the question? Okay. 
Would you want to change the question somehow? Yeah. How would you change it? Can you say? Excellent. Excellent. That's exactly what I was thinking. How does she live? How does the church live? Might be would be would be a more orthodox way to answer that question. How does she live? Yeah, well, how, belief how? is too it's so like heady. Yes, 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 yes. How does she live, by the way? <laughs> In community use of the language. Yes. Yes, yes. Well, okay, in, in communion with the life of God, which means what? I mean, how can you get into the life of God? <laughs> in the death of God. In the death of God. So what does that mean? How does she live? That means that she's living in this, in this uh, process of putting to death what's earthly in her. Although the church herself, there's no death in the church. Yeah. Right? It's not the other side. Yes. She is the body of Christ, and there's no sin in the church. So when we say, how does she live? We're actually talking about ourselves. How do the faithful live who have been incorporated into the church through the death of Christ in holy baptism and have received him as their food and drink? How now do they live? They live by the cross, putting to death what separates us from God. Um, Lizette, how would you answer this question? What distinguishes her from other Christian churches? From other what? Christian churches. <laughs> or is it the same thing with the other question? Does it kind of send you in kind of a disjointed mode? It makes me disjointed. Yeah, why? Because, I don't know, to me, the Orthodox Church is completely different from other church, <laughs> Christian churches. Okay. Let's let's use the anal- let's use the tomb. Um, where are all of the other Christian churches relative to the tomb? Um, How about on this side? Okay. The Orthodox Church is on the other side. She's in the tomb. She's in the tomb. But the tomb opens onto the eternity of God. So this is the kind of question that someone would ask you and me who is still on this side of the tomb with the idea that, oh, there are many Christian churches and they're all the same somewhat because they all believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Well, some of them do. But I mean, from what we have said and what we have seen now from just these two texts, from the first century and the 20th century, you're saying the same thing. After 2,000 years, it's the same teaching. How can you say that there's another Christian church? There's only one church. You picked that for up from uh, Episcopal, some Episcopalian I and Anglican. It's, somewhere it's called the branch theory. theory. My whole life. It's called the branch theory. Branch theory. Yeah, invented by some Anglican, um, what do you call them? Freemason. Oh, Freemasonry <laughs> too, and well. Uh, maybe he was a Freemason, I don't know. It was like in the 1700s, 1800s or so. I might have the century wrong. It was relatively recent. Yeah. That it's not just all Christian churches. It's like the, all religions are the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just oh, yeah. get along and get over it. Right. Now, can I bring back my favorite um, insight on that point? Sure. <laughs> okay. All of these religions are all the same because they're all they're all part of the same monomyth, right? They're just just different variations of this monomyth, um, however you want to describe it. But uh, what, from what we did in adult ed several weeks back, what's at the bottom of that monomyth? What's at the beginning of it? Chaos. Chaos. Every single one of them is chaos. Undifferentiated unity. And to me, that is evidence of the fall of the human mind because in taking us to the beginning and seeing an undifferentiated chaos, it's like 
human knowledge, human wisdom cannot get back any further than the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, halfway up the mountain. Can't see beyond that. It's only in the church, it's only in the in the theology of the church that we begin to, that we see that no, what's at the beginning, what's at the foundation of everything is not chaos, but it's the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity. Not an undifferentiated unity. What distinguishes her from other Christian churches? What do you mean? The question makes no sense, to be honest. Makes no sense. Dan, how would you answer it? What distinguishes her from other Christian churches? There are no other Christian churches. There are groups of people who believe in Jesus, um, some of them more rightly than others, but they're all, they're all founded on some founder's own take on Jesus. And so they're all, they're all, uh, they're all uh, plants that have grown up in the soil that is on this side of the tomb. That's how I would liken it. But the, the, the church, the Christian church, which is the church of Christ, that is the church, that, that is the plant, the vineyard, that has grown from the very body of Christ in the tomb. All right, let's think about that. And uh, let's take our five-minute break and see if the uh, book club left us any muffins. We've got some apple cider here. Uh... Alex, you want to turn that off? And then when we come back, I'm going to ask... Yes. Yeah, so, uh, what the question is, the uh, relationship of the, of the human nature, the human will, uh, to the person of Christ, who is God the Son. Um, and that it was the most natural thing for... It is the most natural thing for human nature to be obedient to the will of God. Um, and then to your point that uh, that if the church and the mystery of the church, which is the communion of the Holy Trinity, is from eternity, then there's a sense, in w- and, and he knows the name of each one of us from, from eternity, then there's a sense in which all of this, um, and it's true, there, it, none of this was a surprise. I mean, that's the whole, it, it did not just... You know, like God, some uh, one day before eternity, be, before time begins, it, dogs, I could have had a V8. And he put together this, this plan for creation. Um, and as St. Paul says, uh, where is it, Ephesians chapter 1, he talks about the, the mystery of Christ and the, and the cross of Christ that was from the foundation of the world. And in Revelations, I am the first, I am the last, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Um, you know, everything is contained, everything is, is, is within Christ. And then again and again in the New Testament, this was happening in accordance with the, in order to fulfill the prophets, uh, what the prophets said. Um, in Ephesians chapter 1, as I was starting to say, uh, you have this word, uh, blueprint, I believe it is, or you know, the, um, the, this foundation that before, that it's translated as predestination, or you have words with predestined and election. But the, the Greek has the sense of this, of a boundary. But within the boundary, this the, cre- the, the creation was created, and that boundary would be God himself and the love of God. And so creation is, uh, as, I, as, I, as I've suggested, in, is, is that creation, it moves. Creation is a movement. It, it moves from nothing into something. Uh, and the movement of creation in, in time is measured by sun and moon. And so we, we have calendar time. And, uh, you know, outside of the church, we experience time as kind of this meaningless movement, you know, day to day to day. Um, and, uh, you know, we have these big events that kind of take us back into a mythological uh, in that time. And this is what gives us meaning in, the, in, the, in our day. But the days themselves are somewhat meaningless. Um, but in the church, time is understood as the movement of God uh, coming out of himself in love to us. And now the time, the movement of time in this world is the call to us to come out of ourselves and move back to God in love. So that the real movement that is driving time is not the movement of sun and moon, but it is the movement of God the Word to his bride, the Virgin Mary, 
and of the Virgin Mary to her, husband, to her bridegroom, the Lord Jesus. And this is what we're all caught up in. So that our, you know, so that Saint Isaac of Syria would say that uh, the purpose of this life is repentance. That is to turn around, get out of calendar time, and enter into the mystery of this movement of God's love, and the love that is of your, own, that is in your own heart. Your your heart is yearning, it's breaking, you know, it's, it's it's straining to come out of herself, you know, to find her lover, which is God. So enter into that. That's what repentance is, you could say. And then Saint Seraphim of Soro, the purpose of this life is to acquire the Holy Spirit to acquire the life of God, to acquire the love of God. So that this is, you know, this is the blueprint, if you will, of creation. So that when the prophets are, are saying this, it's not like they're saying, um, they're, how, how do you, it's, it's, it's like they're articulating the blueprint of creation. Um, and you know, it, it's the history of Israel and it's the history of God that is, if you will, predetermined. From the beginning, God has already determined that this is what he's going to do, and this is how he's going to do it. And so creation has been created in that structure. That is the structure of creation, and that's the structure that the movement of creation is following. So if you want to enter into the meaning of creation, enter into this structure of God's love, which is realized in the union of God and the Theotokos, and the love of God. Okay, so forth and so on. Enough for that, because we have... Let's just take, I wanted to address this for you. Uh, how, um, given the many churches and the devout believers found in them, the a question invariably comes up, what of these others? Are they in the church? Are they Christians? Well, I would suggest that we can start with Hebrews as we try to answer that question. Chapter 1. Verse 3. Um, he is the very effulgence of the glory and the character of the Father's hypostasis, is the word, of the Father's substance, um, bearing all things by the word of his power, making um, and, and having effected or accomplished or made the cleansing of our sins, he has set down at the right hand of the glory of Most High. So um, Christ is the glory of God. Uh, Christ, as we say in the liturgical texts, is the Son of Righteousness. S-U-N. Uh, God is love. So Christ, as the radiance of the Father, is the radiance of the Father's love, that shines on the world just like the sun shines on the world. So, can you, can you contain the light of the sun? And I, and I, what I mean by that, um, can this building, St. Herman's, contain the love of God so that the love of God is shining only here? Can, can St. Herman's contain the light of the sun just in here. Look up there, see? <laughs> so my point is that Christ is the sun of the radiance of God's love is shining over the whole earth. And the whole earth is filled with his glory, as it says in the Psalms. The steadfast love of God, it, it, it extends all the way up into the heavens. The Holy Spirit, we say, is the fragrance of God. So can you contain a fragrance in just a very contained place. No, it spreads the whole place. So what do we say? The Holy Spirit is everywhere present, filling all things. So the Holy Spirit of God fills the earth with his fragrance. So like the warm light of the sun and like the fragrance of perfume, Christ in the Holy Spirit, so this is the church, going to St. Clement, Christ in the Holy Spirit is the mystery of the church, covers the earth. The church is his body. It's not a building or a human organization defined by clearly drawn bureaucracies, rules and regulations. Now, the canon of faith gives expression to the substance of the church, but it cannot exhaust that substance since the substance is Christ, God himself in his Holy Spirit, in his resurrection, 
or his glory and life fill the whole chambers of death. I think this is part of the significance of the fact that God died and, and, and was buried in the tomb. It says in a new tomb, in, an empty, in a new tomb. But if he's buried in the tomb, that means that he fills the whole place of death with his, you know, with his uncreated radiance. So even in the pit of our human worldly existence, which is death, the world and human nature is permeated with, it is soaking wet with the light and the fragrance of Christ and his Holy Spirit. The church then, as we now have seen it described both in St. Clement and St. Porphyrius as this radiance of God emanating from God, its uncreated energies, um, you know, the church being the very communion of the Holy Trinity, being the mystery of Christ and the Holy Spirit, the church then is everywhere present, filling all things. Everywhere present, filling all things. You cannot go outside the church. Wherever the name of Jesus then is uttered, there he is present. I told Dave, my friend at the Y, that I have 10 grandkids, so the Christmas gets more expensive every year. And he says, oh, Christ. And then he remembered that I'm a priest, in a manner of speaking. So I turned to him and I said, well, yeah, actually, that's what I say too. But I add, have mercy. <laughs> I, the point of the story I'm wanting to make is that, you know, when, David, when Dave said Christ, even though it was just, you know, this, six, you know, whatever, the Lord was present. He was making the Lord present. And he liked that. He said, oh, I'm going to remember that one. Um, then we see we have Deuteronomy 4, 7. That might be a play to this question. Um, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God to, uh, is to us whenever we call upon him? And then Psalms 145. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth. So you get the picture? Here's the Son of God, the radiance of the Father, uh, the, the fragrance of the Holy Spirit just covering the earth. So that means that, you know, we're, 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 we're in God's presence. We're, we're, Christ is here. We can't see him, but I mean, he's here. He's, you know, everywhere we go, it's chock full of the presence of God. So whenever you call upon Jesus, I mean, he's right there. He's right there. So when Hans, Alex, Megan, Lisette, when you called on the name of Jesus, wherever you, Tim, and when he was in the Baptist church, when you called on the name of Jesus, um, he was there. He was there. And if you were calling on him in truth, he was right there. And he would be, you know, he's, if you're calling on him in truth, that means you're calling on him from your heart. And so he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna answer it. And he's going to lead you. He's going to bring you if you keep following, if you keep calling him for him in truth. Um, I went to Father Roman uh, years before he died, and I was asked, talking to him about the Jesus prayer. And uh, he said, you know, what he advised me was, uh, you know, just, just, just remember that uh, the Lord is, is everywhere. He's around you, so uh, you know, he's with you. So, uh, you know, just uh, when, you're saying, uh, when, you're saying the, uh, when you're praying to the Lord, just uh, pray to him because uh, that, that he's, he's everywhere. He's all around you, you know. He's with you. He's he knows, and bring the others that are around you into the into the prayer. You know, and, um, so it was the it was the same idea. It was the same understanding. The same experience. That we're, you know, I think that perhaps we have the sense that that we're going along in life, and, and the Lord is way out there, right? So when I remember, I, I say a prayer and I call upon the Lord, and I hope that He hears me from way over there. And maybe if I talk talk loudly enough in my heart. Or if I talk with a, with a feeling that's intense enough, maybe he'll take notice of me and maybe he'll come to me and answer me. That's not the picture. He's right there. Just I mean, imagine the light of the sun that's shining on us even now to be an image of the presence of Christ. He's right there. So it's not that Christ comes, it's rather that I am turning and recognizing and, and calling to mind the reality that Christ is present to me right here and now. And that cannot be confined within four walls of a stone building. Tim? Isn't there, I forgot where it is in the gospel, but don't the disciples come to Christ and say, hey, uh, there's these guys over there and they're... Uh, Samaritans. Yeah, they're, they're, they're doing 
doing stuff yeah. that, that we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're not for against us, they're for us. Yeah, well, I shared with you the story of my grandfather, you know, in China. They're casting out devils. And how did they do it? They, in the name of Jesus. Um, and sometimes they'd have to be praying for an hour, two hours, sometimes all day to cast out this demon uh, from, these, from these people. But it was always centered on the name of Jesus. And they were very clear. This, this can only be coming out through the power of the name. Um, um, Isaiah chapter 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. In other words, call on him. In other, he is near. He's near here and now. I think this may be going back to going, uh, casting forward to Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, where the, the, uh, the, uh, St. Paul writes, uh, Repent while it is today. We're in the 11th hour. Um, it's time now. Um, the Lord is present. So take advantage of the time here and now and call on the name of the Lord because when the last day comes and the doors are closed, it's too late. So... Uh, what I want the point that I want to bring out on this, uh, for the sake of all of us, especially for you know you catechumens as you're entering into the, into the experience of the church and, and and coming upon real people in the Orthodox Church, and discovering that they've got warts just like everybody else, they've got defects and personality disorders just like everybody else. Um, I want you to understand this: that the ch Orthodox Church. In the substance of her doctrines, her canons, her sacramental and liturgical worship, um, uh, which is, um, this is the substance of the church, her liturgical and sacramental worship, um, her doctrines, her canons, this is the substance of the church. And to the degree that that substance is, is, is faithfully practiced, to that degree, we can say, the church becomes incarnate in us and in that community. So a parish may mangle badly the substance of the church and so betray that substance. But the substance, as much as it may be buried or covered over by the faithlessness of the parishioners, does not disappear until it is consciously or formally exchanged for another because the, the the substance of the church in her liturgical sacramental worship is the mystery of the holy trinity which has been which has been from the beginning and will be forever um, so if you come into an orthodox church and you discover that the people there are tearing each other up you know stabbing each other in the back the priests hate the people the people hate the priest the people hate each other they're always arguing and when they're saying in the service it, you know you you it just feels dead. It feels, you know, you want to be somewhere else. You wonder how on earth could anybody become Orthodox? Why, did, why would anyone want to become Orthodox? Just remember that um, the, you know, the behavior of the people is not the substance of the church. Okay? Can you remember that? Um, and even in that church, if, you will, if we would attend to what we're hearing in the prayers of the church and in the worship of the church, so long as they're not changing it, we are, in, we are listening to, we are in the presence of Christ. Okay? The Orthodox, in the Orthodox Church, the body of Christ, this is the last point I'll make, is both revealed and hidden. The body of Christ is revealed in the coverings of the doctrines, the worship, etc., which is to say that the coverings of the liturgical worship, the movements of the worship, show the shape of the risen body of Christ that in the resurrection is spiritual and immaterial. These coverings of the church, her doctrines, her prayers, her liturgical sacramental worship, the rituals, the movements, are so many airs or veils beneath which is the risen body of Christ, the empty tomb that opens onto the resurrection. So we can't stop at the veils. We engage the veils prayerfully, just like we do at the Divine Liturgy. Remember, I bring out the gifts. The gifts are covered, they're veiled, but underneath the gifts are that bread and wine that's going to become the body and blood of Christ. And as we engage that movement, that, that liturgical movement prayerfully, um, we lift the veils. I bring the gifts to the altar, put them on the altar, 
I lift the veils. Now the bread and the wine are clearly visible. They are going to become the body and blood of Christ. And as we engage them prayerfully, um, we discover mystically, invisibly, that Christ is there. Christ is present. He's everywhere present, filling all things. Focused, if you will, right there on the gifts. That is the orthodox, that is to say, uh, and Dan will appreciate this point, the orthodox themselves can be wholly blind to the mystery hiding beneath the veils that are right in front of them. Just like the Jews were blinded by their idolatry. In other words, they were blinded in their heart so that they did not recognize their God when he was standing right in front of them. Questions, comments, observations? Tim? Um, aren't there prescriptions in uh, what the priest is supposed to do if the, the, the gifts actually take on the appearance of flesh and blood? Yeah, there are. Which means that it has happened. Yeah, it has happened. There are stories that affect. That's that? It's usually not a good sign. It right. It's right. usually not a good sign. Because, it, because if, it's, if it becomes that, then it means that we're not on the other side. We've come onto this side. But, but I, the reason why I ask that question is because when I converted, you know, I think there's a tendency to just mean it's like, oh, it's wine and it's yeah. bread and something, something strange happens. Yeah, you know, we kind of believe it. But no. <laughs> no. It's, it's actually. Right. And the church has taken steps in the event that it actually manifests itself as the body and blood. Why would it do that? It does. I don't know why. But as I'm saying, what's that? Lack of faithfulness. Yes. Yes. You know, it's interesting. Some it has happened not just in the Orthodox Church. It has happened like in the Roman Church. But we have different responses to it. As I, what I've heard is that if it happens in the Roman Church, they, they take that as a sign that of providence. Yeah. Uh, but if it happens for us, oh, because you understand what's happened, what I just said. If that were to happen, that means that we're on this side. We're on this side. We're not in the tomb anymore. So we leave it alone. We don't want to be on this side. We're to be on the other side. Yeah, it's not consumed. It's not consumed, right. Right. Okay, that's a kind of an interesting note to end on, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not worried about it, to be quite honest. <laughs> I'm going to be watching here. Yeah, right. No, I'm. Yeah, don't worry about it. Okay, let's say a closing prayer. Truly, it is me to bless you, Thelatopos, ever blessed.